British Airways is one of the UK's most visible brands. It sells Britishness as a mark of quality. Some passengers are happy to part with small fortunes to fly in its first class. A one-way fare is just over $10,000. But in the last decade, the business has faced financial crisis. Today, more people fly EasyJet than BA. We all fly to the same destinations, so what can we do to stand out? As the airline reaches a turning point, our cameras have been allowed unique access to its inner world. From the top-level decisions... We're not as big in China as we should be, so getting this right is very important. ...to the daily challenges of its global operation. 552 Rome's back on stand to offload a passenger who's having a panic attack. We've been following some of the airline's 40,000 staff. Do you know what the pressure is on? As they work to meet exacting standards. Very disappointing. In this episode, we'll reveal how they train their newest recruits. It is almost like being in the military. If you receive four snapshots, your contract may be terminated. Keep their 280 aircraft in the air. At this moment in time, it's broken. And bring the world's biggest passenger plane into service. It's sort of making history for us, really, isn't it? And I'll never do anything like that. The airline's headquarters are at Waterside, just outside Heathrow. training course today. Just to remind you then to wear your passport whilst you're in the building. <laughs> 18 anxious new recruits are about to start their first day of cabin crew training. OK, well, firstly, welcome to the mixed fleet operation within British Airways and congratulations. I know thousands and thousands of people applied this year to join us and we selected approximately 800 people to be sat where you're sat now. So you've done extremely, extremely well. Cabin crew are the face of the company and are expected to look immaculate. The skirt has to be on the knee, so that's absolutely fine. Any drinks or snacks? <laughs> For many of the recruits, the uniform is part of the job's attraction. Very excited. Very excited, yeah. <laughs> Especially now I've got this. <laughs> From the very beginning, being an air stewardess was sold as a glamorous job, a sort of finishing school in the sky. Ladies and gentlemen, you may now unfasten your seatbelts and smoke if you wish. I think it was every bit as glamorous as I thought it was going to be. In fact, it was so glamorous that I used to just walk around London in my uniform because I just used to think it was just so cool. Ross Hanby was the face of the airline in the 1970s. It was definitely important to look good. You were worthy in flight entertainment. You weren't allowed to get married. There was an airline called Pan American when I was flying, and they used to weigh their stewardesses before going on each flight. I don't think the word sexual harassment existed in those days. But, you know, we were, we all helped each other. I mean, I'd say, you know, look up for 19B, he's looking a bit tricky. Ta-da! Nearly life-size Ros. When the photography took place, they were very embarrassed about telling me, well, actually, we're, we're not going to use your body. And they told me it was because I was not tall enough. But, as you can see... <laughs> Have you decided you're going to wear your hair? Um, in a bun. <laughs> or one of these... 20-year-old Jodie Paris is one of the youngest recruits. For her, joining the airline is a chance for adventure. I've been working two jobs for God knows how long now uh, in this tiny little town, and there's just such a massive world out there that I haven't seen yet. The hat is to be worn over the right eye. Thank you. You're ready now, aren't you? I love it. <laughs> I'm really proud of myself and I just can't wait to can't wait to start and deliver a world class service. But not everyone who makes it onto the course will get to the end. Some sessions are gonna be very light hearted. This one's a little bit heavier. The next six weeks are designed to uncover who is and who is not BA. It's an eighty percent pass mark. It, that's not hard. It's frontline cabin crew, Cy Jones and Nadine Phelan's job to make sure the recruits have got what it takes. Time. 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 Thank you. If you're a little bit late for your flight, do you think you can stick your thumbs out on the runway and get the 747 to pull over and pick you up? 
Not going to happen, guys, is it? So punctuality is definitely one we're going to be putting onto our course contract. British Airways has always been renowned for its cabin crew and certainly to get a job at British Airways is very hard. But I think it's because we don't want to dilute what we have. We don't want anybody to fail. Do you think then if you're not getting it quite right, we're going to tell you? Yeah. Would you want to know if you're not getting it quite right? Yeah. We can do this either verbally or we can do it by what's called a training snapshot. In this case, in points doesn't make prizes. We're not Bruce Forsyth. We don't want you to accrue snapshots. These snapshots are recorded, documented. You do not have the right to appeal. OK, and you're going to carry that with you for the rest of the course. If you receive four snapshots, your contract may be terminated. OK, because you're not demonstrating to us what we expect from British Airways cabin crew. All right, are you all happy? Oh, OK, the wrong happy is the wrong word. Do you all understand? <laughs> Size snapshot warning has its desired effect. The snapshots and the points. Slightly terrifying? Yeah, I think, yeah, slightly nerve-wracking, to be honest. 29-year-old recruit Alice Kennedy is plain mad and likes nothing more than spotting them in her spare time. I would probably say I'm a bit of a plain geek and I just, I love plane spotting. I was on the M25 in the summer and, ashamedly so, I actually um, went into the back of a car because I was plane spotting. For Alice, when it comes to planes, size definitely does matter. That's an A340. I like the A340, it's really good and it's, it's nice, it's got the four engines as well. You know, they're a bit more interesting, there's a bit more to look at. I definitely prefer to watch the bigger planes coming over. So there's a 747 there, um, taking off, which is brilliant, it's my favourite plane. The noise and just the sheer size of the plane is just, it's just fascinating, I love it. The company has the largest fleet of 747s in the world. The trouble is, it's also one of the oldest, and they're heading for retirement. OK, I just had a message from Mr Walsh. He's going to be here in 15 minutes. Airline boss Willie Walsh is planning to modernise the fleet. With funding from banks around the world, replacements are on their way. If you look at the aircraft that we have on order, that we've committed to, the list price of all those aircraft is about 27, 28 billion US dollars. Now, on any scale, this is a very big capital expenditure, you know, very significant investment. One of the key new planes in the company's spending spree is the A380. Built across mainland Europe and the UK before being assembled in France, it's the biggest passenger jet in the world and has a list price of £250 million. When these different sections are assembled, the wingspan will be the length of eight double-decker buses. The airline industry is very competitive. The A380 is designed to make us more efficient, reduce our fuel bill, improve our environmental performance and give us the opportunity to expand our network as well. Six years in the planning, the company needs to make the most of the A380's arrival. And it's wrapped this press event in the Union Jack to give the air of a national celebration. The brand is masterminded by a Dutchman, Frank van der Post. You know, the Brits are, I think, too reserved to talk about their own strengths. And, and when I came in, I said, guys, you know, you don't understand what it means to be British, and we should be proud of that. You know, everybody kind of looks at you and they're like, what's this mad Dutchman all about? But, you know, there's something to celebrate. I mean, these aircraft are quite expensive, and I think there's expectations of, of customers, high expectations, and it's up to us to make sure that we, that we deliver to those expectations. For all the fanfare, many customers have already experienced the A380 at Heathrow. Emirates has a fleet of 39 and has been flying them since 2008, outstripping its British rival in passenger numbers and encroaching on its luxury territory. Everything you see out the window is British. The wings are British, they're made in North Wales. The engines are British, Rolls-Royce, built in Derbyshire. But more importantly for our passengers, it's a beautiful aeroplane to travel in. Persuading people to spend more to fly has always been critical to the business's profits. So this, I think, is the, uh, the killer cabin. I think this is the one that's going to make BA lots of money. This is Traveller Plus. Got a slightly larger HD screen than we have in the economy cabins. The innovators of premium economy 
their business and first-class tickets account for only 14% of passengers, but can bring in as much as 45% of revenue. This is known as Millionaire's Door at Terminal 5, for those select few who fly first class. They have access to their own lounge, restaurant, spa and champagne bar. Competition in the luxury market is intense. Emirates A380s offer suites and onboard showers. For interiors manager Catherine Doyle, it's all about the airline's invention, the flatbed chair. So this is first class. This is a variant of the seat which you'll see in our 777s and our 747 fleet, so lovingly known as, uh, as the Prime seat, and this is called Prime Plus, literally because it's the same seat, so our customers will recognise this, but then because of the space, we've been able to really grow it out. So when the bed goes to flat, we have far more bed space, and this is the other big item here. So this is our suitor. So you've got a lovely big gap under here, which actually is capable of taking an IATA size wheelie bag. So no more of, oh gosh, I've forgotten something, rummage around in a bin. You literally just have to lean out of your seat and help yourself. So this is bespoke, and we painstakingly inspect every single item. Back in March, when we did our final inspection on this aircraft, I actually spent two days, literally on my hands and knees, inspecting every inch of this cabin. Everything has to be perfect. A first-class ticket will cost around 10 times the price of an economy one. So this is 4K, the rear of the cabin. When we first inspected it, there is a tiny, tiny scratch just here on the corner. There. <laughs> it's, it's not even a scratch because you can't even feel it. To be honest, it's probably just an imperfection in the bright dip of the anodise. The feedback we get from our customers, especially in the premium cabins, does go to that level of detail. So they'll tell me that there was a scratch here or um, you know, a ding there, and they spotted it. And, and that shows you what level of detail they live their lives by, and therefore we have to replicate that experience with the first brand. The airline's training base is at Crane Bank, a few miles from Heathrow. Wait. Here, generations of cabin crew have earned the right to represent the airline. And two at the front of the cabin. This latest recruitment drive comes in the wake of bitter industrial dispute. After a period of unrest and strikes by cabin crew in 2010, BA decided that future recruits would be employed under new terms and conditions as part of what the airline called their mixed fleet. Your seatbelt. Come this way. Today's intake follows the same training as their predecessors, but are paid less, in line with their budget airline counterparts. JD, we're going to start with your brace positions. When you're ready, please adopt the crew brace position. The first two weeks of training are about safety. Thank you, Jodie. Going to move on to look at the smoke hood now. Show me how you'd get that smoke hood ready for use and if you'd like to correctly fit the smoke hood, please. The airline has not had a fatal accident in 29 years. Turn around for me. It examines its recruits on every emergency procedure. OK, Jodie, if you'd like to take that off now, please. Jodie, I'm sorry to say that you haven't met the standard for this assessment. In crew brace position, your head wasn't back. For the smoke head, the bottom half of your bun was sticking out, so that can allow smoky air to get in, OK? Jodie's failure means she'll receive a written warning. Jodie, if you want to just go and take a seat down there for me. All right. Right, what just happened is the SCP Equipment Practical Assessment and you failed it. So that means now that I need to give you a formal letter, which I'm going to give you a copy of to read. If you don't reach the required standard, your contract could be terminated with British Airways. Do you understand that? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So what we'll do now is we'll take you back downstairs. I've worked so hard, it'd be such a shame to you know, I have it all thrown, thrown away for a couple of, you know, silly mistakes. It doesn't seem like I've worked hard because obviously I have failed a couple of things, but I am working so hard, you know. There's been a few nights where I haven't slept because I have been revising and stuff and going over my drills. It's not the easiest thing, though. But it is. Many of the trainees are joining from other airlines and have been through the process before. <laughs> Don't worry. You've just shown me... I can't be kicked off the course. Yeah. You're not going to get chucked off the course. You've just failed one exam and it's not the end of the world and you're going to go back and you've just shown me the correct position. So you do know it. Take this off when you go in because you can't brace with that jacket on. Okay. 
was a virgin. I failed about six times. Really? At Terminal 5, Heathrow, it's the first big outing for the company's new plane. With 10 rival airlines already flying the A380, for staff like turnaround manager Lisa Horrigan, it's a relief to be catching up. I'm glad that we're finally keeping up with the new technology and new aircraft types. It's sort of making history for us really, isn't it? And I'll never do anything like that. <laughs> the airline's first fully trained A380 pilot is Captain James Basnett. Before every flight, we have a good look around the aeroplane to make sure the hatches are closed, make sure all the engines are in good condition. Everything that is really sort of a, a normal pilot would do on however big a plane, whether it's a tiny Cessna or an aircraft this size. It takes 22 cabin crew to run a plane this big. Thank you. OK, down with the pre-boards, please. Street across and turn right. Please ensure that all electronic devices, including mobile telephones, are now switched off. Shall I take you up to the front door? Please. Perfect. Show me the way. Sarah, would you mind just watching that door while it's open? Thank you. Last person on board is Frank, here to launch proceedings. So are we good to go with the PA or shall I do it for you? No, the phone, right. you remember? No, I don't remember. Okay. There we go. Push to talk and off we go. You have to talk quite closely, so. Good afternoon everybody. This is Frank van der Post. I hope you settled in well and comfortable. It is great to have you on our flight to nowhere. We encourage you to kick back and relax. We do serve you a glass of wine, but I ask you one thing, please, don't scratch anything. With a cruising altitude of zero feet, this plane isn't going anywhere. The passengers are all staff who volunteered to come in on their day off to sit on the tarmac. It's a pretend flight to Hong Kong to see what works and what doesn't. The drinks were coming from the World Traveller galley, which meant crew had to walk through the World Traveller cabin into World Traveller Plus. And when you've got a heavy flow of customer traffic, that can be quite challenging. I think it's a nice customer enhancement, but we just need to try and make it work. A couple of miles away on a mock-up plane in Cranebank, Trainee cabin crew Patrick Flynn and Alice are investigating a possible fire in the toilets. Okay, just push the door very slightly. No, I don't need that now. There's no smoke. Okay. I mean, there's no fire, sorry, no flame. Have you checked in the firm? Okay, so there are still flames, Patrick. Do you want to use the BCF? Oh, sorry. Excellent. Shh. What have you found, Patrick? Okay, so you found matches. Excellent. OK, I'll go and report back to the captain, just bear with me. The trainers think that they found a new star. Yeah, that was just <laughs> so long in that hood. Alice helped him through that. Alice was right. fantastic. She, she really did. Really did. He so went off. She prompted him all along. He was really good. He was helping me. Alice! Congratulations, you've passed. Thanks, yay! Um, Any points? No points. Oh, my God, amazing. Your role as a coordinator just then is one of the best exercises I've seen recently, if not ever. Thank you so much. Blinded. That's lovely. Former call centre worker Patrick is equally determined to excel. Right. Patrick, well done. You have passed, but you pick up one point. That's actual point, not a mark. That's like one point. That is one point. My friends think I've come to BA to serve coffee and to serve tea. The stereotypical trolley dolly all smiley faces. This is the captain. This is an emergency. Brace, brace. Brace, brace. But I think BA cabin crew are the best crew in the world. It's the service that they give and it's the way that they deliver the service. Patrick leaving from door two right. Jody leaving door two left. And I think because of that, I'm feeling more apprehensive. But I've just got to try and not let it get to me. Lean forward. I know I can do this job and I know I can pass this course. Is that, is that everything? That was not very good luck. No problem. At Terminal 5, the flight to nowhere is in its fourth hour. No, it's not landed yet. So we're just waiting for it to come on stand, or land and then come on stand. To pretend an aircraft's not there when it is, then, yeah, it's a little bit weird. In economy, they've finished eating and are watching movies. 
In business and first class, the fine wine and dining takes a little longer. We have a Chablis, which is a Chardonnay, which is perfect for the sea bass today. And um, we also have a Vino Gris, which is Australian, and it's best with spicy foods. In charge of delivering a gourmet tasting menu for the A380's elite customer is chef Mark Tazioli. That's it. It's a difficult task when the food has to be ready-made and reheated at 30,000 feet. It's good for taking long to eat the soup, yeah. right? And you want it to but be then a little bit of um, time between the course okay. as you work out the line. Right. I have a much better understanding around the way these ovens work now much better understanding around how it's affecting the people out there. So, by the time this goes live, they'll have the instructions like when you do this dish, when they clear that, put that one in the oven. Captain, now we're making good progress to Hong Kong. Very shortly we're going to be sequencing our descent. And disappointingly, the weather is, there is very similar to how we left it in London. Kevin crew are just going to start getting everything back into the galleys. The trial is at an end. With seven weeks before the big flight to LA, the plane will be flying short haul routes to iron out any problems. Hi, Lisa. Hi. How are you? Good. How's your trip? Yeah, it was good. BA runs the biggest aircraft maintenance operation in the country, with five and a half thousand engineers servicing its fleet. Last year, a technical fault resulted in an engine fire on a BA A320 flying to Oslo. In the emergency landing that followed, no one was hurt, but it shows there is no margin for error. Every night, every plane is checked, and if it needs special attention, it's brought to the fleet support unit in this hangar. Veteran engineer John Beatty has been working nights for 26 years. We have a look around the aircraft for any damage that may occur when it's on flight, those like lightning strikes, bird strikes. And unfortunately, birds decide they like to hit the aircraft. And if they hit the engine, they could go down the engine. You then do a boroscope, look inside to find out whether there's any more damage in there. You normally know because it smells awful. An ultrasound is used to look for hairline cracks in the fan blades. We just put a, a bit of jelly onto each blade to just aid the sound. So here we have the decibel reader, and you see there we've got 300 decibels. If it was above 700, that might well mean we have to, have to change that particular blade. The airline has 280 planes being used across 170 routes. Keeping them flying is a big task. On a busy night, the casualty hangar may need to get up to 10 of them fixed and back into service, all with different problems to be solved. We're changing the fuel control unit, or the FMU. That's the one that's going to go on. This is like a big carburetor. Grounded planes are an airline's nightmare. If the planes aren't flying, they're losing money. Passengers aren't moving, and people are missing connections. The system can quickly break down. So in the operations centre at Waterside, it's a constant juggle to keep the schedule working. The team here are responsible for the entire network, moving about 110,000 people a day on 800 flights, many of them on the Airbus fleet. We've got, I've got 111 aircraft in our Airbus fleet. There are 58 of them here and there are 53 of them overseas. Most aircraft will do four to five flights a day. We couldn't actually park them all on the ground at Heathrow at one time anyway, because there isn't enough room. So it's a constant movement of aircraft in and out. Steve Duffy is lead engineer in operations. It's his job to track which of the sick planes might not be able to fly on schedule. OK, then. Well, we'll start off um, with Ian in the FSU then. Ian, if you could... He's on the nightly 3 a.m. call to get a status update. Okay, uniform, uniform. Uniform Tango's windscreen change. They're only just starting to refit it within the last hour. That's on an 06, but there's no way it's going to make 06. There's no way that's going to happen. Well, I'll start looking at 12 o'clock, have a chat with Ops and see what we can do about it. Echo Delta November, the FMU's fitted. All right. We're aiming to push that out for 4 o'clock and get some runs out of it. Hopefully that will make it 06 ETS. All right, well, we'll keep a listening watch for that. We'll talk to you later. Thank you. 
Hello, mate. Hello, Chippy. How are you? Yeah, not bad. What's going on? Windscreen change. Having a bit of trouble with the sealant. Initial provisional estimate they're giving me is 12 o'clock. Yeah. Um, I reckon it might go back a bit past that. So if I roll the programme up to, uh, well, to its last departure as such, yeah, I'm happy that, with that? Yeah, that'd be a good start. Hello there, morning. We have got a couple of changes. Um, he wants to change uniform, uniform tango. Um, the windscreen isn't going to be coming up in time. You've got uniform hotel and you have Yankee Lima. OK. Back in engineering, uniform, uniform tango is supposed to be flying to Aberdeen with a new windscreen at 0840. OK. But time is of secondary importance to safety. The windscreen has been fitted, but they had a problem. The gaps around the outside of the windscreen were not quite right. That's just gone backwards probably half an hour. It's, it's not an easy job. Because of the pressure of the aircraft and the pressurisation, there is actually a lot of force on that windscreen. And if it's not in the right place, and if that screen fails, the consequences are catastrophic. They had a windscreen years ago that was fitted with incorrect screws and the windscreen exited the aircraft and the pilot was hanging out and his head and his arms were flailing down the fuselage at how many thousand feet. The other pilot flying the aircraft had to deal with holding his, his colleague in place and flying and landing the aircraft. And that was a very, very stressful and, and dangerous situation for the flight crew. So, this is the usual look down for me. For new recruit Jody, nightly maintenance has a different meaning. Cabin crew are required to look immaculate at all times. So, when do you get uniform? I'm getting it tomorrow. I had my uniform fit in, like, I think about a month ago. Yeah. We've got to have... Have you got to buy the shoes? or? Do yeah, they... we've got to buy them. We've got to have, like, loafer shoes for the service and then actual heels, like, walking to and from work. How do they expect you to be presented? They like you to... I think they like you to wear quite a bit of makeup. Like, it says the minimum makeup that you should be wearing is lipstick and blush ass. So what motivated you into lockdown? Taking a job with BA. I was on the beach in Ibiza and I was sunbathing with my friends and this bottle was at my feet. I picked it up to put it in the bin okay. and I noticed that there was a message inside the bottle. Really? So I opened it and I'd seen like this essay, like pages and pages of writing. I was like, oh my yeah. God, what is this? And then I started reading it when I got back to the hotel and it was from this guy and he was just explaining about all these different countries that he'd been to and why he'd been to them and all this crazy stuff that had happened. Yeah. True. Is that true? Yeah. Really? I've got the, I've got the letter at home. Have you? Yeah. He didn't leave many like contact details or anything. Come here. With exams every day, the recruits also have to study every night. For Alice, it's been more than she expected. It is quite all encompassing, I think. I actually had a dream about a plane crash the other night, which was awful. I think there are a lot of misconceptions out there about being cabin crew. I knew it was going to be hard, and I've always been fully aware of what they've done, but there are so many other areas that I hadn't realised that we'd be doing and it has been hard because there's just so much to remember. So I think in that sense it's been, it has been harder than I thought it was going to be. Because Heathrow is in such a densely populated area, noise pollution is always an issue. The last scheduled flights land before midnight. But the fleet support unit still need to do an engine test on Echo Delta November, which is due to fly to Tel Aviv at 10 past 8. Going on one. Give us a call when you're ready. It has to be done in a ground-run pen with a special acoustic lining to muffle the sound. It's already 4.30 and the team are having problems installing the new fuel metering unit. We've got a little leak. Now, it may be that when we put it together, we might have pinched a seal, maybe, or it's just, just a little... We just nipped it up and it may or may not cure it. We don't know yet. I think they've got a fuel leak on the run. OK. So they just uh, open the cows to have a look at it. Well, I mean, obviously, we're just going to just have to roll up at the moment. And, yeah, literally just roll the whole pack up. With each aircraft allocated a route, the scheduler has to move the sick plane as far back in the morning schedule as possible, in the hope that the extra time will be enough to bring it online. So I'm just basically creating a what-if situation. So worst comes to the worst. 
And we can literally stretch it back to 11 o'clock. That'll be the next departure, which will be at Tel Aviv then. Right, I'll just give that a little couple of minutes or so, and then I'll shut it down again, OK? Not including manpower, the airline spends around £625 million a year on engineering. It's probably in the region a quarter of a million dollars for a fuel metering unit for, a, for an Airbus aircraft. I think if you do the sort of work that we do, you tend to be isolated from the real costs because it is so vast, you know, one fuel unit is as much as your house that you tend not to um, think about it in the same terms as, as everybody else. But uh, I think we recognise that, that there, is a, there is a vast cost to maintaining aircraft. With the flight schedule starting in under an hour, the news for Echo Delta November is not good. Is that exactly the same place? OK, all right. If it's coming from exactly the same place, then we might have to just go through another seal there. All right, here we go. I'm not sure how long it's going to take, but uh, at this moment in time, it's uh, broken. OK. Thanks, then. Chippy, yeah. you're going to have to do a swap with the Beirut. Right. Okay. Need, needs to come back in to, uh, to take the fuel unit off again. OK. Even with 100 Airbuses in the fleet, it's not just as simple as swapping an aircraft. Because it's the M6 fleet, it's running our Terminal 1, the 321 Airbus fleet down there. That's a very specific uh, reason being is because we offer a flatbed service to our passengers, so it's a very specific seating. The thing could happen is at uh, 9 o'clock, is that uh, if Echo Delta November doesn't come up, then uh, we could go into problems. Although there are two aircraft still being worked on, the team's juggling has meant they start the morning with only one half-hour delay. Driving into Crane Bank at dawn, Jody is painfully aware of how important it is to stay on schedule. I've never ever got up this early in my life, never. This is torture. Just two weeks into the course, the new recruits already know what flights await them. I think I'm going to Paris and then I've got Nairobi after Christmas and I'll get to like play with the animals, which will be lovely. But, I don't know, it might be dangerous, so I might have to just stay in the hotel and sip on pina coladas. Morning, everybody. Morning. How are we all? On today's agenda, medical training. <laughs> Your lungs and liver might come out as well. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do as we did yesterday. Listen, we'll do as we did yesterday and go around the room. For Jodie, now, the studying is paying off. Jody, number four, you are assisting a healthcare professional who needs to insert a catheter, lovely day you're having, from someone suffering from urine retention. You need two. What would you need to do, Jodie? Um, is it B? Peel back the sterile packaging of the catheter, add some tepid water to activate the dry gel solution and it's ready for use. Exactly. But there's no multiple choice answer on how to deal with the dead. This is a very grey subject, yeah. isn't it? Because it's on the day. Right, okay. The main thing is you cannot block a door, no. you cannot put a dead passenger in a toilet. It's not respectful and also they are not strapped in for landing. If they slid off the toilet, which could easily happen when you land, they will end up on the floor and they have to take the aircraft apart to get that person out. And it's, can you imagine putting somebody on an aircraft toilet? Yeah. It's not. Oh, no. So in nice, easy world, which somebody dying on an aircraft isn't, you put them back in their seat. I know crew that have had to sit next to somebody that's passed away for the rest of the flight, and it's ho all of this is such a horrible topic. Did you make them maybe look like they're asleep, put a blanket over them, We used them to in. do, many years ago, you know, give them a vodka and tonic, a Daily Mail and a, you know, eye shades, and they'd be like, yeah, they're fine. Blend We'd have to do... Literally, you would put them in the and <coughs> cover them with a blanket up to here. Mm -hmm. To be honest, please don't think that when you first so go online, you're going line. to have a death, a birth, a fire, <laughs> <laughs> a decompression, and then you're going to ditch Thank on the way <laughs> In the afternoon, the trainees head to the simulator to work on their resuscitation skills. Look how small this environment is. If you have a 14, 15, 20 stone man, how on earth are you going to move them anywhere but the aisle? So, Jodie, you're coming down the cabin. 
Ready? And one of your passengers is not very well. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? There's no response. Okay, Heather, we're going to need to do it. Chest compressions. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I just stop it just once. I just want to give you a help because you seem to be bouncing the back of your hand up. So the heel of your hand always must be in contact with the chest. Okay. So show me some compressions. Remain calm, good compressions. That's much better. Jody. that's what I want, okay? That's what I need. That's enough. Round of applause, I think. Jodie, you've listened to every word that I have said. Really? Those compressions were excellent. So you've done everything that I asked you to do. Well done, yeah, everybody. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a nice place to work. For most people, plain food means plastic trays and stodgy dishes. But in the early days, food was about creating the perception of comfort, even luxury, at altitude. To this young passenger, there must be a special magic about lunch being served so high above the clouds. So is everybody clear about what we're doing? Yeah. Trying to recreate that sense of magic is chef Mark Tazioli. Then we're going to go with the braised pork belly and cheek. He's working with the airline's catering company on a tasting menu for the A380. Playing the role of first-class passenger is customer service manager, Toby Thompson. Oh, do me a favour. Can you time it? I, I don't want it to be too quick. You know, it can't have five courses like wham. Well, from your point of view, I yeah. want to know how comfortable it felt. Yeah. Serving him is Sarah Louie. In three weeks' time, she'll be supervising the food on the flight. So a lobster dish. So it's lobster and a shisha dressing with mango. Clean taste. Flavor's really good. Yeah. Better than I thought it would be, actually. All the hot dishes are reheated in the A380 steam ovens. Working out the timing is key. He's finished that course already, and we've still got another 12, got 12, minutes. 12 minutes to go. So, realistically, if he ate it that quick. Well, let's see how long the whole service takes. OK. Mm -hmm. Do we have the pea puree? Truffle sauce and asparagus. Very nice. Oh, it is lovely. Enjoy. Thank you. But for all the poached lobster and seared scallops, the chefs know it's not just about taste. Let's face it, flying a long haul can be a little bit boring when you're sitting there. You know, when you get your food, it's in front of you and it's one of the only things that you've really got to concentrate on. So actually, people can be very... They've got the time to be quite critical. The braised pork cheek, the pork belly, the heritage carrots. Where's our specs? I don't think we've got enough sauce in it. Yep. Yeah? Our customers, especially in first, are very detail-driven. They will notice every single detail. There will be some pressure on the day to make sure it's perfect. So it looks good, apart from it needs a bit more sauce than that. We'll check the specs. So probably when you get it on board, it'll have more sauce than that. With safety and medical training done, now the new recruits must learn what it is to be the face of the airline. Oh no, I have bought a spare pair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> On your ankle. Oh, already. Oh my god. During customer service training, they're required to meet uniform standards at all times. Okay. Nothing's moving that today. Lovely, thank you so much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, are we happy to? Begin. If you've got a handbag on one shoulder yeah. and then your bag on the other shoulder, you're all going to be ruffled and your shoulder pads are going to come up. All right. It's all right. It's all right. Patrick, <laughs> the way you scarf. Yeah, put it round. And it's just fell down now. Somebody nearly said something in the canteen, so I was like, it's my first day, don't worry, I'm going to get told now how to put it on. <laughs> are we all happy? Good morning. Constant self-scrutiny is demanded of all BA cabin crew. The new recruits are shown their imperfections Step forward, Step forward. Forward. <laughs> with the help of some special mirrors. Are you looking the part? The magic mirrors, they are mirrors essentially, but when you approach the mirror, you will see a member of our staff wearing their uniform to the correct standard, and it's something that delegates can model themselves against. You're looking yeah. very baggy at the front there. I would perhaps suggest that some are a little bit overwhelmed by how much 
their uniform is going to be looked at at every single step of the journey. But, you know, there's no room for ambiguity and they're all well informed. It could be nine o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the afternoon, your hair and makeup must look immaculate. This isn't Amnesty today, and we won't snapshot you today. But if the behaviour continues, then obviously from here on in, it's a snapshot. If the recruits stray from the required uniform standards, they could be off the course. The trainers must reinforce just how critical it is to meet expectations, especially when it comes to Premier customers. Everybody's got aircrafts made by Boeing or Airbus. We all fly to the same destinations and we've all got flatbeds. So what can we do to stand out? The service, and that all comes down to you guys. Now let's talk money. So say we're going to Los Angeles, that's a ten and a half hour flight. How much do you think a Club World ticket is? Oh. For a fully flexible, <gasps> nine and a half thousand. <laughs> John just hit the nail on the head. What did you just say, John? You want your money's worth. Exactly. Yeah. With a smile, in the premium way. You're going to be expecting the very best. Nine and a half thousand pounds return to LA for ten and a half hours. For me, it's like the other half live. That's nearly my entire year's wages. It's just so crazy. I can't believe someone paying that much. Like, it makes me feel really worried. I'm actually really worried. Like, I'm actually scared. Like, how, like, they must expect so much if they're paying nine grand for a flight. Like, that's just crazy, isn't it? At Heathrow, there are no free tickets to fly. Although in engineering, they do sometimes find the odd stowaway. We did have an incident where Somebody had tried to stow away on board the aeroplane, but fortunately he didn't realise it was coming over here, and of course when we opened it and then Nico's door to do a check, he fell out. What would have happened if he'd, if he'd flown? He would have died. It's minus 56 or more, plus you haven't got the oxygen in there, so you will die. I think we need to ask them to come and rehoover this bit of the carpet though. OK. So if we just raise that one as a generic for the whole cabin, then we know that they'll sweep through. Yeah, I'll just check those out, board bins. It's the night before the A380's inaugural flight to Los Angeles. And for detail-obsessed Catherine, it's time for another check. We're just really making sure that the finish is exactly as it was on delivery. Was there anything picked up on this one at all? Yes, so there was some scratch marks on the suitor door, which you just passed. Perfect. Our job is just to make sure she's looking tip-top condition. You might damage it on the way in from, say, LA, or the next person that gets in your suite on the next flight would never know. That's our, our aim going forwards. Whether in the first-class cabin or in economy, the airline needs the A380 to be a success. With Heathrow's slots full, they can't put on any more flights. The only way to increase passenger numbers is to have bigger planes. Why can you only see that bit of yours? You can see the whole Because our eye foot is slightly higher. So should I put mine higher? The end of training is in sight for the new recruits. Nerves are on edge, especially for those with snapshots. If a trainee accumulates four, it means they're off the course. Patrick, we obviously need to get him in before we start the next session. Susan, do you mind staying in the room as a witness? No, of course not. Okay. Hi, Patrick, take a seat. Patrick has landed his third snapshot for not remembering the seat configurations on the long-haul aircraft. Seat lettering across a row of World Traveller seats. It's 343, three, and you've put 242. Two. <coughs> and then just one more. You've got that door wrong. You've got them inboard and not outboard. Right. All right? Right, OK. Well, it's not OK, but I don't know what I can do. I don't know okay. what I can do about it. Well, Because you... I do know, I do know the 747 technical, and I do know the 777 technical. Right. Well, you know what's coming next. I do, yeah. Snapshot I'm going to be delivering to you. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a third snapshot, right? Okay. which results in a written warning. We can't afford to get another snapshot now. No, I can't. Because that would be four snapshots, and you know the limit is four. Yeah. All right, so I just want to stress the importance to you. Our expectations are that you don't get any more snapshots. It is very, very strict. I didn't expect it to be so strict, but if I get another snapshot, then that would be pretty much it. Then that means I've got nothing. <laughs> I don't even want to think about that, because I've, I've got no job. I've got... I give up my job to be here. I've saved up, like, literally thousands of pounds to be here. So if, if that ever happened, touch wood, it never would. I don't even know what I'd do.
At Heathrow Terminal 5, the crew are arriving for the inaugural long-haul A380 flight to LA. And for the big send-off to Hollywood, the airline has booked Melanie C. And X Factor winner, Matt Cardwell. For all staff, the first port of call is the Crew Report Centre. For the first flight on the highly competitive LA route, some of the company's most important customers are on board. The pressure's on to deliver a seamless service, especially if, like Sarah, you're serving the new tasting menu. I'm actually really nervous. Honestly, I haven't slept. I've slept two hours. It's a bit of disbelief because it's, it's all happening now. So I'm actually here in the CRC and it's even more nerve-wracking because you see everyone that you're going to be flying with. You're confident. Yeah, I'm as confident as you can. There's time for a pep talk from customer service manager Rob Nickel. Do you know what, gang? I'm going to sit down. It's an incredibly high-profile flight today. Quite genuinely, you know, the world is watching. Our competitors are watching. So do you know what? The pressure is on. Um, I won't lie, but you're all sat here for a reason. Personally, as your manager on the day, I've got 100% faith in each and every one of you. It is just an aeroplane, yeah? Galley's a galley, teapot's a teapot, door's a door. It's just a wee bit bigger, this one. And can we all just contract with each other now that we're going to look after each other, yeah? Do number three, if you're happy. As the plane goes through its final checks, I'm Frank Van der Post. Meeting and greeting its first passengers is Frank Van der Post. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a quick trip for me. It's an exciting moment, isn't it? It's quite, quite special. I think we're going through this door, right? Yeah. Just want to head straight across and turn right, okay? okay. <laughs> While business class tickets will cost in the thousands of pounds, economy will cost several hundred but come with a little less space. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Six years after it was first ordered, the airline's A380 is finally on its way to Hollywood. So in this session, we're gonna have a look at how do we manage challenging situations? It's the afternoon session for the cabin crew recruits. The focus is on customer service. Sir? 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 For trainer Sai, there's a chance to show off his dramatic skills with some role plays on how to handle difficult situations. Alice has to cope with an obese passenger who can't do up his belt. Can I just ask you all to unfasten your seatbelts, please? Mine doesn't fit. Right, OK. I'll go and get you an extension seatbelt and we can... Um, no. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. No. OK, well, we do need to make sure your seatbelts are fastened. You've got a blanket so I can put over top of it, then? Um, I'm afraid we do need to make sure that seatbelts are visible at all times. It... What did she say? It needs to be visible at all times. It needs to be visible at all times. And again, it's that assertive behaviour that we want to see when you are challenged by a customer. We want to see you actually doing things like that. Really well done, Alice. Jody is tasked with communicating with a French woman. Excuse me. Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> Would you be able to uh, put Je ne comprends pas d'anglais. That's why I tried as well. <laughs> <laughs> She's speaking. <laughs> if you don't speak the language, please don't try to think you sound French. Think of how you'd feel. First and foremost, you'd, you'd be a little bit insulted. Please don't try to do it with another accent. Mr. Oh, Johnson, oh, here's oh. your seat. Well, well. Okay, so you're just right on the edge of yeah. Already on two snapshots, Jody is struggling with the role play scenarios. Where's your trolley? Hello, sir. Can I get you something to drink? Yeah, I have a red wine, please. A red wine. Just in front, this customer is visually impaired. Remember that booklet we gave you on day one that tells you how to talk to our customers who are visually impaired, describing where you're placing things on the tray table. Imagine a clock, so talk about, you're gonna place it in the six o'clock position. I'm gonna pay, I'm gonna pay your mind, let me. Okay. Oh, God. You're good. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Lovely, thank you. Enjoy. Thank you, it's fantastic. With the instructors watching closely, 
the pressure is on for the tea service. Here's your cup of tea, sir. Would you like any sugar or sweetener in it? Sure. Explain where you put it. So think about it. clock face at the 12 o'clock position. The teapot's in the 12 o'clock position. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> Please. That's, not my, that's my fault, sorry. <laughs> Jody, just to let you know. A cup of tea in the 12 o'clock position for you, okay? And you've got a little chocolate just left of it, okay? Jody, I'm just going to finish off the coffee service. I just need to squeeze past, okay? Thank you. Would you like another coffee? I think you have three, which is what I want to see. I'm trying to cut you through it, all right? And this is all alien to you. Before you get set, because you look like you're about to burst into tears. All right? It's all about teamwork, communicate. And this is for everybody, okay? <clears throat> is it really important to go away and read that booklet I gave you on additional needs customers? Were you trying not to laugh? Oh, that's good then. What about? But he thinks I was crying, so that's even better. Yeah, that's better. He was like, he was like, Jody, don't get upset. <laughs> <laughs> Jody's performance lands her her third snapshot. Basically, I couldn't take the fact that my friends were acting differently. I don't know, it just made me laugh. So I didn't stay focused. When I was serving them, I found it slightly funny. But, you know, I just wish that I stayed focused because at the end of the day, they weren't being assessed, I was. So I just accepted the snapshot and just said, I'm sorry. So are you worried? Yeah, of course. Really worried, like, imagine now I have a ladder in my tights. I've got a little bit of hair sticking out. That's a snapshot. So it could be something so small that could get me kicked off the course. I've just got a lit I've got to watch my back like 24-7 because any little thing could jeopardise all this hard work and you know, all these sleepless nights. Yeah. You know? It's a few hours into the A380's inaugural flight and the moment of truth for Sarah and her new first-class menu. Seared scallops with pea puree, asparagus and truffle sauce. OK. Thank you. You're welcome. Regular first-class traveller Dr Peter Walker takes 300 flights a year. For him and his guest, expectations run high. Yeah, it's certainly one of the most sophisticated British Airways menus I've seen served. Ambitious, as you say, always nice to try new things. There's also a heck of a lot of food here. Three, four starters. The sustainably sourced seven and Y cod, which we still don't understand because cod is an Atlantic fish. Then you have this whole light bites. Very, very ambitious. Exciting new plane, exciting new first class yeah. proposition. They've had to push the boat out. Let's see how they, Indeed, how they, they deliver. They to start with, they've opted for the souffle and the brioche. I'm doing the brioche cheese and souffle. Yeah, I'll play that up for you. But will the reheated food deliver? I'm going to have to drive it. Do you mind? Yes, you will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They've been overly optimistic to think that they can deliver the souffle. I think they have to put that into a word. I'd say it's a disaster. The only thing I can taste in that of the little seeds. Whatever that seed is, it's a kind yeah. of thing that's got overbearing. Goya cheese with whole grain mustard souffle with autumn vegetable salad. You have this experience in your mind of what might come, and then you have that. Visually, it's disappointing. How's yours? The parfait itself delivers a, an acceptable flavour. It's good, it's light, as a parfait should be. The brioche is where, where this is disappointing. Brioche should be crispy on the outside, soft on the inside, and that's it's just solid all the way through. It's like one of those toasts you buy in a French supermarket. Very disappointing. Rising to the challenge of first-class expectations is never simple. I don't believe it's over-ambitious because it's what our customers have been asking us for for a long time, which is why we're doing it. Um, I think over-ambitious, no. Um, teething problems, yes. But Frank is staying positive. Very well cooked. Nice and moist. Yeah. So far, so good. There's a second meal service coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're going to tea next. yeah they're, all, they're all sleepy now. Who knows, they wake up cranky, I don't know. Back at Crane Bank, 
there's some bad news. One of the recruits has been given their fourth and final snapshot. Guys, welcome back from lunch. As you probably notice, there's one team member missing. Patrick, unfortunately, won't join, won't be joining us for the remainder of this course. Um, now, I know it's not, it's a very difficult piece of information for you to digest now, but we, we had to make that decision. We are here, of course, to support you, so we will respect and wait for you and how much time you need. Would you all like a moment? Okay. So we'll, we'll be here, so do, do come back. You think that it's always a possibility, but you never think that it will actually happen. He was such a big character, so um, I think people have been really sad um, and a bit puzzled. It is quite hard, because you don't really want to see anybody off the course, but this is the process and this is what we do at British Airways, this is the way that we do it. Do they get a chance to, do they say goodbye to the... No, they don't, they don't get the chance to say goodbye to any of their colleagues on the course. So, um, a trainer would go in and collect the belongings of the delegate that's being terminated. I'm absolutely gutted. I think it would have been an asset for British Airways to have Patrick on board. I knew him to be reliable, I knew him to be hard working. These things happen. His fourth snapshot was issued on the basis of being two minutes late to class. It is almost like being in the military. So, I mean, the trainers tend to say, obviously, that, you know, you can't be late for a flight, you know, if it... Absolutely. On-time performance is key, but that's why we have airport standbys, is it not? They've already got that mitigation process in place, and to put so much time and effort, as Patrick did... And step off when you're ready. He gave up a job. It's coming up close to Christmas. Relocated. He'd already waited over a year for a position to have put his all into it and to have his dream snapped away from him. It's just gotten to have something like that just took away from me over silly little things. The hiring of a younger, cheaper cabin crew to serve its new fleet has been a big strategic success for the company. With thousands of eager applicants, the airline can afford to be strict. You are presenting British Airways. You are an ambassador for British Airways. Just because you're not in the classroom doesn't mean somebody isn't seeing you. You don't know who works for British Airways and who doesn't. The airline takes its recruitment process very seriously. Patrick's departure leaves the rest of the trainees in no doubt of just how much the airline expects from them. It starts from day one. There is no, oh, we'll let you off this time. It's you get a snapshot if you're wrong, and then you get out if you've got too many. So I think the course is intense to show you this is what you're getting into. A bit of a heads up rather than being a total shock on your first flight. Touching down at LAX, this A380 is a sign that with a new workforce and a new fleet, BA is growing again. As it fights for its position in the highly competitive airline industry, it will find, like Patrick, there is little room for error. Next time, Trouble in New York as the snow hits. This is our fourth major snow event, and it is a little iffy. It's pandemonium when the airline opens a new route to China. Currently, the uh, systems are down. We're trying to resolve it. And on three snapshots... Will Jody make it to graduation? And that'll be at nine next Monday. Next tonight, the Culture Show meets the author.